So thank you all for coming. Um, so as I said, my name is Amanda Hakes, and the program I think it says Amanda Simmons. So it happens when you have two people named Amanda on the project together, it gets a little mixed up. But um, today I'm going to be talking about short notice in the Hudson and a population estimate that we're working on. I want to acknowledge all of the co-authors on this project. I feel like the collaborative nature of this project is how is why and how it's getting done. So. Um, so I'm going to start with the land acknowledgement. Um, so the Hudson River is known as the Mahikatuck, which is the waters that are never still in the Munsee langu uh, language. The Hudson Valley is an ancestral homeland of the Munsee Lenape people, who are the indigenous people of this region. Despite tremendous hardship and being forced from here, their communities currently reside in Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and Canada. They comprise the Delaware Nation, Delaware Tribe, the Stockbridge Muncie Community, Band of the Mohegan Indians, the Muncie Delaware Nation, and the Six Nations of the Grand River. I threw this in here because I feel like the Native people, Sturgeon, was one of their most prized possessions. And um, working with the estuary program, and um, they work with the education department, and they've been working with the Muncie um, community. and. We've been working, doing some sturgeon stuff with them, so it's been pretty cool. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about the Hudson River, for people that don't know, some short nose life history. Uh, there has been some previous population estimates that have been done, the estimate that we're cur currently working on, which is some newer technologies of tagging, side scan sonar, and some gill netting, and then some next steps. I was hoping we would have some data for this presentation, but as I go on, you'll see, um, and I'll explain why. So, for those of you who don't know, two species of sturgeon that live in the Hudson, the Atlantic sturgeon, which gets to be very large, 14 feet long. They're the anadromous species that live in the Hudson. Uh, so they spend a little bit of time and they leave and migrate along the coast. If you're here for Evan's talk, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more of that. Um, I'm going to be talking about short nose today. They only grow to be about three to four feet long, and the majority of the fish spend their entire life in, within that estuary. So the Hudson, it's tidal to the Troy Dam, which is about 245 kilometers. So it goes uh, uh, New York City to the Troy Dam. The two yellow stars on the map, uh, one near High Park, is where we're doing our overwintering survey, side scan survey. And the uh, one by the Troy Dam is near Albany, which is where we did all of our acoustic tagging. So another telemetry pro uh, um, presentation you sent through. Um, so, the life history of short nose, they're long lived. Um, males mature before females. They s probably don't spawn every year. Females, probably every uh, three years. Males, more often. Uh, they're resident species, species in the estuary, as I mentioned before. There are records of migrations between river systems, like Hudson fish ending up in the Connecticut River, which is next door. But for the most part, they spend their whole life in the estuary. Uh, and, you know, they eat things that live in the bottom. They're considered amphibious, which means they move between saltwater and freshwater within the same life stage. It's amazing how much the, how much the fish move within the, in, within the estuary. Um, they inhabit rivers all along the coast from Canada to Florida, and they were listed a very long time ago in the Endangered Species Act. I think they might be the first fish that were ever listed. Uh, so, in the past, there's been two population estimates that were done. Uh, Bill Doble did a uh, population estimate in the late 70s, early 80s, estimated between 9 and 19,000 fish. Mark Bain came in 17 years later, and he saw a 400% increase in the population. The independent sampling, if you were any, in any of the, the talks uh, about the Hudson River Biological Monitoring Program, that that um, sampling also saw an increase, a uh, smaller increase, but saw an increase nonetheless. So we decided we're going to embark on a new updated estimate. We got funding from Hudson River Foundation and the Hudson River Estuary Program, and using some newer technologies that we had kind of uh, used with some Atlantic sturgeon uh, work that we did in the Hudson using side scan telemetry. So there's two parts to the project. You have your side scan uh, sonar portion and your telemetry portion. So the telemetry portion is your acoustic tagging 
Uh, we maintain a river-wide array uh, from New York City to the Troy Dam. We also, for this project, uh, deployed a winter array in a focal area near the overwintering area for short nose. And then for your side scan, you have all of your side scan data that you collect with images that are created, which give you uh, images that you can actually count the fish on them. Uh, and then we do some gill net ground truthing to get species composition, uh, size structure, stuff like that. So the acoustic part, we tagged fish over two years in uh, April and May near Albany. We put out 100 tags, and I feel like this is like every talk, 10 year battery life. Um, in 2021, we tagged 50 fish. So we were a little nervous about um, code collision at the overwintering area. If all of our fish showed up, we probably we wouldn't hear anything. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't put all the tags out and flood the system and not get any data for year one. So we, we, we did it over two years. Um, we were trying to get equal numbers of males and females, but you know how that goes. It doesn't always work out. And on average, you know, female, females are larger. Uh, so we put the, after year one, it seemed like it would be okay to put the rest of the tags out. So we did, uh, same time frame in the spring, uh, caught less females, but on average, they were larger as well. So we have the riverwide array that we maintain for, uh, for this project, but as well as other projects that are happening along the coast for Atlantic sturgeon that are tagged along the coast and move into the Hudson as a spawning area. So we uh, maintain it from April to October, and that's because we use Coast Guard buoys to hang our gear on. Uh, we get permission from them and agreement from them. So this is uh, on the right side. We're putting out a receiver in New York Harbor, which it looks really nice that day. It doesn't normally look like that. Um, it's usually really rough. And, there's a million boats and there's not one boat in that picture. Um, so, for, but like I said, for this project, we're also um, deploying a winter array in the focal area that we're side scanning, which I'll show you some pictures of uh, coming up. So we use a combination of acoustic release receivers and receivers that we put out that we have to grapple for to get back. So there's a, a dozen of them. Uh, the picture there is an acoustic release receiver set. So in 2021-22, um, so, uh, I don't know, maybe four years ago, we were side scanning out there for some other reason, and we went through the, the overwintering area, and the amount of fish that were there was crazy, which is how when you spend a lot of time in a boat with somebody, you get lots of chances to talk, you start to come up with projects, and this project was kind of a brainchild of many hours on a boat together. Um, so we went out in some sub subsequent years and found the kind of the core area where we thought the fish were and we set up uh, transects. So that purple box on there is the transects that we did last year, um, look, looking for the sturgeon uh, and then creating the images for the counting. Those green dots are where the receiver array is. So we have uh, an idea of when fish come and leave this focal area, and then our counting happens in that, in that focal area. So after we collected all the data uh, and all the detections, downloaded all the receivers, uh, made some changes to the transect for this year. So we still kept that focal purple box, which is in the middle there, but we extended a little further north and a little further south. As we were seeing fish kind of slosh around in that area over time, and sometimes they're outside that focal area. So to get a better idea of uh, you know the numbers of fish there. We moved it a little bit this year. Um, so this is the side scan unit that we that we use. It's an edge tech. It's a high resolution side scan that we tow behind the boat. And for anyone that doesn't know side scans, it's kind of a quick little schematic. So we tow behind the boat. The area directly below the side scan is called the nadir zone. There's just no data is collected because it shoots both out both sides, and that's how you um, sound out both sides for the development of the images. So it's like shining a flashlight on the bottom. You have the reflection of the object as, and also a, an acoustic shadow associated with that object. So you would have a fish with a shadow, which when you're counting fish, I'm going to show you in a couple minutes, you have um, the image of the fish and a shadow. And if it doesn't have a shadow, it's most likely not a fish. So kind of trying to work through all those protocols as we're, as we're moving through this project. 
So we, uh, last winter, 21, 22, we gill netted every time we went out and side scanned. And we caught uh, really no, nothing else. We, at the, on the last uh, side scan survey, we caught two other non short nosed fish, but all the fish that we caught during the side scan surveys were, sh were short nosed. Um, so this year we decided it's a lot of effort to take two boats and a big crew of people in the middle of the winter. And, you know, netting in the middle of the winter is not, not, not nice for their staff, but also not great for the fish. So we decided we would just gill net three times, the beginning, middle, and end of the surveys for this year. <clears throat> so this is a side scan image that's created by the side, side scan. And the post-processing is the part where is the reason why we don't have any data. So the post-processing of this data is taking way longer than anyone expected. There's just so much data every time we go, and we've been going every other week. So uh, John, Dr. Madsen, John Madsen at the University of Delaware is having a really hard time keeping up. So this year, he's really hoping that the water, that the river freezes, so we stop going. And stop going. <laughs> I don't think he's going to get his, his wish. <laughs> I thought maybe, you know, but we're supposed to go on Monday, and it looks like it's going to be 50, and you know, so I, I don't think he's going to get his wish. Um, so he, the post-processing is he lays the grid over top and, um, and creates images for sections of the transects. So uh, it's a 20, 20, 20 meter by 20 meter grid that he lays over top and using dot dot goose software, which is mostly used for bird counting, um, but it seems to work pretty well for, for this project for counting sturgeon. So the next one I'm gonna show you. So this is uh, an image of a, of a section that would be counted. So on the left is, the, they're both the same image. One has the yellow dots, which is the software. So it allows you to mark what you think are fish and then count them up. And I think it gives you a total count in the corner, like what, how many dots you have. Uh, but you can see on the left-hand side one, there's a, a target that's not very bright, but it has a really nice shadow associated with it. So that would be considered a fish. Um, and the distance target to shadow shows how far the fish is off the bottom, how high it is in the water column. Um, and then on the other side, you see there's a bright target, but no shadow, so that wouldn't be counted as a fish. So we have uh, a couple staff that are working through these counts. Um, we have, a, I think, a student at University of Delaware, and then we have a, a DEC uh, staff person that's helping with this fish counting part. And it's pretty time consuming, so a whole day of side scan data, they, which takes us about two and a half hours to collect, it takes them a whole day to count um, the transects. So the fish are, are congregated, so in those areas there's thousands of fish in small little spots. The rest of the transect is empty, pretty much. <clears throat> so you end up getting, you know, all these boxes with all these counts of fish. And then this is the part that is, is not 100% clear to me, which is why Dave Kazak and Shannon White and all these other really smart people are on the uh, project to do this next part of the modeling. So you have two modules. You have your sonar module, you have your telemetry module, and you know, you're gonna bring them both together to get a river-wide estimate. So you take, count in your sonar model, you take your counts from the transects and scale it up to estimate the total number within the focal area on each sampling date. And then if we know how many targets were in the area and what proportion of the focal area that we scanned, you can scale that up and get total number for the focal area. And at this point, you can, I think you can add in your gill netting to get species composition, but for that part, uh, I don't think they think that's gonna be necessary since we've been catching mostly all short notes. And then on the other side, you have your telemetry module. So you use the receiver network to model the distribution of the fish within the river and then estimate what proportion of the tagged fish were in the focal area reach on each survey date. So ultimately, you, if you know how many fish were in the survey area and what proportion of the total fish this represents, we can scale it up and estimate the whole river. So uh, we're gonna continue to go out and collect our winter data, even though that would not be John's wish. Um, it's underway, like I said, we're planning on going on Monday, uh, bi-weekly. Um, uh, through the mid part of April is the plan. 
we've completed two of the three Gilnet surveys, the first one and then the middle one, and we've only caught short nose so far, so that's good. Um, and then, you know, we have 10-year life tags, so long-lived tags, they stay within the river. It's not like they're only here for a month, couple months like Atlantic sturgeon. We're, we're going to get pretty good movement data. Um, so the one, the one issue is, is we don't have receivers out year-round. But, you know, at a certain point of the year, you, you don't think fish tend to move very much, right? And they get to an overwintering area. So um, we did start putting some other receivers out with, without surface buoys for the winter um, in some key areas. And I think that's something that we could continue to do uh, into the future once this project gets over to kind of monitor where they move, if they do move much over the winter. And ultimately, maybe rewrite the, the life history books for this fish since we have these long-lived tags. Um, so that's it. Any questions? <laughs>